Seven years after its establishment, Indiana University's Institute for Korean Studies now serves as a Korean studies hub in the Midwest region. The collaboration between IKS and KEI began in 2016 when the Institute was first established. And we have been co-organizing various events dealing with the current political and economic issues involving the US and South Korea. Today, we are hosting a panel discussion on the urgent topic of the impact of Russia's war in Ukraine on East Asia. Let me now introduce Dr. Clint Work. Dr. Work is a fellow and director of Academy of Affairs at KEI. In addition to his work on KEI's publications, he leads KEI's university outreach and conducts research, writing, and public engagements focused on U.S.-Korea relations. Please welcome Dr. Work. Thank you, Sung Gyung. Um, I'll make my remarks very brief. Um, I, I want to echo pretty much everything Sung Gyung just said. Uh, and thank, in particular, the Hamilton Luger Schools um, East Asian Studies Center and Robert F. Burns Russian and East European Institute for their co-sponsorship and support of today's panel. And a very special thanks um, to IKS for their, their support for today's panel, uh, our past collaboration, and hopefully our, our future collaboration moving forward. Um, a lot goes into coordinating these events lots of email and lots of Zooms and to have it all come together is really fantastic to finally see. I do wanna also give a special thanks to Sung Gyung and, uh, and Emily uh, for helping coordinate um, visits by myself and KEI's Vice President, Mark Tokola, who I see is, is taking photos of me as we speak, um, uh, to help us visit some of the classes here on IU uh, Bloomington's campus. Um, uh, Dr. Bovington's class and uh, Professor Oxendahl is right as well, where we were able, able to engage students on U.S. Korea relations. Um, and it's really a key part of our university visits. Um, for those of you who don't know about KEI, it is a policy research institute or think tank, but also a public outreach organization uh, in Washington, D.C. And it's solely dedicated to helping Americans, both policymakers in Washington, D.C., but also the broader American public, better understand the full breadth and importance of U.S. relations with the Republic of Korea or South Korea, but also the Korean Peninsula in general, and of course, the broader region. Uh, and today's panel is really a key element of KEI's programming, which involves going outside of the Beltway in D.C., to engage the broader American public. And our university program and, and panels like today are really a unique and important element of that engagement. Um, and so today's panel, Rethinking the Liberal International Order in Asia under the impact of Russia's invasion against Ukraine, uh, will of course provide the US and Korean perspectives, but also the Japanese, Chinese, and Russian perspectives too. Um, and without further ado, I'm very happy to introduce our panel moderator, but also one of our presenters, Dr. Gil Rosman, um, who has a very long and rightfully illustrious bio, but I will just uh, sort of shorten it by saying he's the Emeritus Musgrave Professor of Sociology at Princeton University and Editor-in-Chief of the Asan Forum and maintains a prolific pen that I could only aspire uh, to achieve at some point. Uh, so Gil. So glad to be here. Uh, it was way back in 1965, you can age me, when I had just graduated college that I spent five weeks at IU and five weeks in the Soviet Union in what was the premier program for the study of Russian, um, yeah, for the study of Russian nationwide and people even came from Europe. It was really terrific, and I met my wife there, and so I'm very grateful to Indiana University for this experience. I also am very grateful to KEI because they set they they set very high academic standards in trying to understand 
ongoing issues in the region. It's been a pleasure working with them. And we have three panels um, uh, each year these days. We, uh, and this time it, we have the National Identity Panel, which treats uh, the liberal international order as an issue of identity in, in various countries. And we also have a geopolitics panel and an economic regionalism panel uh, at different universities before that at uh, uh, international conferences. Uh, so this is an opportunity to think deeply about what's happened over the last year and how various countries, very active in Northeast Asia, are reconceptualizing the international order. Uh, we're not thinking so much about the European consequences of the Ukraine war, but of the Asian consequences and trying to get a, a stellar cast to, to explore what the impact is and to have four interrelated, uh, similarly organized papers to draw out the implications and make some comparisons about how uh, nations have been responding to this uh, tumultuous, far-reaching change. And I'm delighted that we have here with us um, panelists who've been writing papers and also a couple of discussants who will be adding to our understanding of this regional context. So let me briefly introduce them before we go on to our first uh, paper presenter. Uh, Tobias Harris is here. Uh, he is a, um, a deputy director of the German Marshall Fund. Uh, they're moving to link Europe and Asia as is happening a great deal these days. One of the big developments of the last year and we're fortunate to have him. He writes frequently for a number of major publications about Japanese foreign policy. Um, we have uh, next um, Jacques Delisle, um, a distinguished professor at uh, University of Pennsylvania Law School, also a PhD in political science uh, from Harvard and very, uh, very prolific in his writing about the impact uh, uh, looking from a legal and political science angle of uh, developments affecting U.S. relations with China, particularly, uh, but also Chinese understanding of, uh, of, of issues affecting uh, international law. Um, and then we have, um, actually before Jacques speaks, Hannah Kim, who's over my shoulder, uh, and we're fortunate to have her uh, from, uh, she's an assistant professor at the University of Nebraska Omaha, and she's been doing some interesting survey research in South Korea, and she will give us a Korean perspective on how this uh, international order is being reinterpreted. Um, and well, we also have a paper on the Russia-China perspective looking both ways, and I am the uh, co-author, but the original author uh, who dealt, deals very well with Sino-Russian relations and their historical memories, including World War II, is Katie Stollard. And I will presenting, be presenting on behalf of her. Did I miss anyone? Yes, of course. Sorry. Gaia Christofferson, last but not least, despite my uh, omission. Uh, I'm a little flustered here. She has been working uh, extremely, doing some extremely interesting work on Sino-Russian relations. And she has worked on <laughs> the cross-border relations between Northeast China and the Russian Far East and the relations in Central Asia that uh, affect both China and Russia, especially Kazakhstan. And I am delighted that she has joined me in uh, writing most of a book and co-editing a book on Putin's turn to the East in the Xi Jinping era. And so I'm very happy she has joined with us. So without further ado, I turn over to Tobias and we head into our presentations of our papers.
So um, I guess I, I've drawn the short straw and get to uh, I'm gonna move this a little further away. It's kind of loud. Um, I guess I've drawn the short straw and get to to kick us off by talking about um, Japan. Um, but first, of course, thanks to to KI for really the invitation to come and speak. It's really a, a pleasure and and really I think just such an important subject um, that even though I didn't contribute a paper to this, but um, it's something I've been thinking a lot about. You know, and and most of my work for the last year. So. Um, really uh, grateful for the opportunity, um, and of course, also to Indiana University for hosting this and Institute for Korean Studies. I mean, really, uh, as a Midwesterner, Chicago native, it's always good to get back to the to the Midwest, and uh, feels like a homecoming. Um, so, so really thankful for that. Um, with the the topic that we have to discuss today, I'm, I want to basically start with a uh, a proposition, and I think. Um, I, I think if you look at Japan's uh, national security strategy released in December, uh, I think that the evidence will be will be fairly clear. And, and um, my the proposition I think that will that I want to start with is just the reality that if you look at Japan's strategic documents, uh, remarks by senior officials, just its thinking, really going back for uh, at least a decade, um, I, I think there are probably few countries in the world that can match Japan's um, commitment to the idea of a rules-based international order. And, I, and, I'm, and I'll, I'll come back to uh, this question of whether it should be, we should think of it as a liberal uh, rules-based international order or just a rules-based international order later. Uh, but I, clearly, I think there's a, a conceptualization of Japan's national interest, um, you know, usually framed as defending the lives and property and prosperity uh, and human rights of the Japanese people. Uh, there is, I think, a thorough recognition that Japan would struggle to ensure those national interests in a world that was not a rules-based international order to an extent maybe greater than, than some other countries. There's sort of recognition uh, of Japan's dependence on a world that is rule, go rules govern, uh, that is predictable, that enables uh, the kind of economic integration that Japan has benefited from both in terms of trade and investment. Uh, of course, also uh, a maritime order with uh, freedom of navigation given Japan's dependence on uh, overseas uh, energy resources and other resources, its access, its dependence on overseas markets, its dependence on overseas production facilities, uh, all of which is becoming more important given uh, at this point now the inevitability of population decline in Japan. The fact that Japan is is embracing for it's going to have a smaller market and it needs to find uh, younger, faster growing uh, populations overseas to maintain its prosperity. So there's, a, I think, an explicit uh, recognition. In fact, I think if you read the national security strategy that Japan released in December, you know, of course, much of the attention was on some of the decisions that it included uh, about Japan's uh, defense capabilities. But if you read that, I mean, it is a thoroughly economic document. It is very clear about Japan's economic interest, the way Japan's economic interests are, are linked to the existence and the maintenance of a rules-based international order. Um, and really, this is, I, th I think, you know, this is not something that began over the last year. This is, I think, a role that you can go back at least a decade um, and, and really, I think, became apparent during the Abe years, uh, a, a recognition that Japan couldn't, could no longer just be a passive beneficiary of this. It couldn't just, you know, ride on the on U.S. coattails. It couldn't, uh, it was no longer sufficient to um, be as, I, I think, protectionist as it had been in the past. And so you saw a Japan that was willing to take uh, a leadership role um, and and really be a rule setter in a way, in a conscious way that it hadn't necessarily been before. Um, and yeah, I think clearly the most obvious example of that is uh, not just uh, Abe bringing Japan into TPP within the first months of returning to the premiership, but not just being a passive participant in that, but then actually being an active uh, participant and, and leader alongside the United States in shaping that eventual agreement. And then, of course, after the U.S. withdrew, uh, Japan deciding that it was going to revive the agreement and really taking a leadership role uh, in that sense. And so you, you did have a, a, a self-conscious assumption uh, that Japan had to be uh, responsible for rulemaking. Um, and there were point to other examples in which Japan was aware uh, that, that it had this responsibility and that it had to play it not just within uh, the Asian region, but globally. 
I think, though, when we look back at the last year, the impact that the Ukraine war has had on this thinking of Japan and its place in the international order and its dependence on a rules-based international order is that you know, clearly what is at stake is no longer just protectionism. It's no longer the, the turn against trade agreements in the United States. It's no longer Brexit. Um, it's much more fundamental. You know, and I think, if, again, if you look at not just at those documents, but look at rhetoric from, from Japanese leaders, you know, you know, I think they are, of course, concerned that uh, Russia's invasion of Ukraine uh, is a is a is a threat to a fundamental pillar of the post nineteen forty five international order. This idea of uh, a norm against uh, you know outright territorial aggression, and that uh, what you know could be you know Ukraine today could be Taiwan tomorrow. And I think that of course uh, has preoccupied the thinking of many Japanese thinkers uh, over the past year. Uh, and as a result, I think you saw. Uh, over the past year, a response from Japan uh, that was quite dramatic, that I think uh, certainly um, at the end of uh, December uh, 2021, I don't know if you would have anticipated uh, that over the following year, we would see the things that we have seen uh, Japan do over the past year. I mean, it's really been quite remarkable. Uh, first, immediately after the war began, and really even just before, uh, you had a very clear uh, clear signals from the Japanese government that it would be a full participant in the whatever sanctions the United States and its G7 partners introduced. Uh, and frankly, I mean, I wrote I wrote something shortly shortly before the war began, uh, suggesting that the United States should not overlook Japan and should not assume that because Japan uh, was relatively passive in 2014 when Russia uh, annexed the Crimea, that uh, it should not assume that Japan would be as passive this time. But it, it did things uh, that even I did not anticipate Japan would be able to do. And so um, you could look at this as first, it joined uh, quite fully the sanctions regimes and some of the financial, the financial sanctions, sanctions on, on Russian assets. Um, these were not just uh, slaps on the wrist aimed at Russian officials. These were, you know, Japan signed on fully to broad based sanctions, uh, albeit while still buying some Russian energy. Um, it also was quite. Um, also, in its support for Ukraine, and, and that included something that we hadn't seen before, which was non-lethal assistance, uh, military assistance for Ukraine. Again, something we have not seen uh, Japan do. We've seen it provide uh, pretty substantial aid for for the Ukrainian government, civilian assistance uh, to Ukraine. It allowed Jap uh, Ukrainian refugees in, not enormous numbers, but again, if you look at Japan's record on this, uh, this was a pretty remarkable, remarkable departure. It's sort of a recognition. Um, that, that there was something different about this conflict, that this really was uh, about standing up for international order. This was not just um, a, a local conflict in Europe. I think the second thing we've seen is, is an acceleration of efforts to strengthen ties, not just with the United States, which of course, I mean, there's been a, a commitment, I think, you know, strengthening ties with the United States was the pillar of the Abe administration's foreign policies and recognizing that Japan had no alternative uh, to keeping the United States engaged in Asia and uh, committed to being involved, not just militarily, but politically and economically in the region. Uh, clearly, those efforts have accelerated. Uh, we saw uh, not just uh, Prime Minister Kishida's visit to, to Washington last month, but I think just before that, the meeting of foreign and defense ministers uh, really announced, I think, quite a uh, an expansive set of measures and really, I guess, homework assignments for the alliance to undertake going forward and a real uh, strong commitment uh, to strengthening cooperation um, and, and really dividing up roles in a way that we haven't seen before. But it wasn't just um, ties with the United States. We also saw over the last year uh, a really, I, I think, an acceleration of, of uh, ties, deepening ties with Europe. And we saw uh, Prime Minister Kishida visit uh, or attend the NATO summit for the first time last year alongside uh, his uh, South Korean and Australian counterparts. Um, we saw, uh, I think, more intense and, and frequent communication between uh, the leadership of Japan and the leadership of the European Union and European national governments. Just the tempo of calls, meetings at the highest levels, um, something that we just had not seen before. And again, there was you know, there were, things were building up this way. You saw during the Abe years, of course, a, an economic partnership agreement with Europe, uh, with the European Union. 
uh, the formation of a strategic partnership with the European Union. But now I, I think what we saw over the past year is when there is a crisis, when this is now being called into question, that these relationships can now be called upon. And I think we're going to continue to see a deepening uh, of those ties this year uh, with Japan uh, holding uh, the presidency of the G7. I, I expect we'll see uh, a return to the NATO summit uh, as well. I think the, the last uh, response and maybe maybe the most dramatic of uh, the three responses we've seen to the Ukraine war is, of course, um, a, a real wake up call, I think, in Japan's approach to its national security and, and its willingness to uh, defend itself and, and to consider the roles it's willing to take um, and recognizing the links. Uh, when we think about Japan uh, defending itself, recognizing that it's not just immediate threats to its territory, but to its immediate neighborhood. And that there's a recognition in particular, I think, that is now uh, very, very deeply rooted, and certainly at the elite level uh, in Tokyo, that uh, Taiwan's security is Japan's security. And, and I think that is, that is now a consensus view at the elite level. Um, and so related to that, then we saw, of course, a decision by uh, someone who in the past had called himself a dove, uh, Prime Minister Kishida doubling Japan's defense or announcing that he intended to double Japan's defense spending over five years. Uh, after years of debate, his government announced that Japan would acquire what it calls counter-strike capability, the ability to uh, strike at targets, uh, uh, counter-attack against targets in other countries. Um, and, and I think underlying all this beyond sort of the initial the, the policies that were announced is I think you, there's been a wake up call among the Japanese people. I think the shift in Japanese public opinion shortly after the, the war in Ukraine began is remarkable and unlike anything I've seen in my time as, as a watcher of Japanese politics and foreign policy. The Japanese public, I think, see, saw the reality of uh, 21st century war uh, and recognized that Japan needed to do more to defend itself and to uh, shore up deterrence uh, in its immediate neighborhood. And, and so, of course, there's a lot of work to do. Um, policy documents are not policy. There's a, lot, there's a lot that has to be done. But in terms of the, the change in consciousness of both, both the elite level and the public level, uh, there is no going back. I, I think the, the, there, there, there has been a real uh, change. So what happens next? Um, I, I think there's there's a few things just to think about. And again, with Japan hosting uh, the G7 this year, it's really timely to think about this. Uh, I think we do have a Japan that is willing to lead, that recognizes that it has to play uh, some sort of leadership role in, in a rules-based international order, particularly on economic issues, uh, not just trade, uh, but also digital digital standard setting, infrastructure standard, set, standard setting. Uh, but I, it knows it can't do it alone. And I think if you look at, I think what was really a remarkable speech by Prime Minister Kishida at Johns Hopkins in January, where he called upon the United States, not just to come back to the Trans-Pacific Partnership, but to recognize that it had, it had to be involved in economic rulemaking, that Japan just can, does not have the way to do it alone. Um, it had to return to rulemaking, particularly in, in Asia. And so, uh, of course, you know, doubling down on this approach, bringing, trying to bring the United States back in, you know, being a partner with the United States, but that it can't do it without the United States. Um, I would. I said I would go back, come back to this and this idea of whether Japan is committed to a rules-based order or a liberal rules-based order. And I, you know, I, I think to a certain extent Japan is uncomfortable. For example, when the Biden administration talks about the world divided between democracies and authoritarian regimes, that uh, and if you look at Japan's national security strategy, they were very careful to say they had problems with some authoritarian regimes and very careful to recognize that they can live with all sorts of authoritarian regimes, but the problem is uh, some of the more revisionist uh, uh, authoritarian regimes. And so I think the world that Japan wants to live in is a rule, rules-based international order in which the advanced industrial democracies are perhaps in the driver's seat. They're able to maybe set the agenda in which their, their voice carries substantial weight, uh, but it is not an order that is exclusionary. They, I mean, I, and that includes China. I don't think Japan wants to exclude uh, China from a rules-based international order. I think they would prefer that China would play nicely in that and would be more of a pillar in that. And I think they would like to go back to maybe how things were trending uh, 15 years or so ago. Um, but I think that is the world they want to live in. It is not a, a liberal bloc that excludes authoritarian regimes. It is a world in which there are clear rules. It is predictable. Uh, Japan has the opportunity to prosper as it has in the past. Um, and, and 
advanced industrial democracies are able to carry a voice, a, a major voice, I should say. I think the last thing I'll note, and if you listen to the kind of remarks you're hearing from Japanese leadership, particularly ahead of the G7, I think they're very concerned about where the global south fits in an in international rules-based order. And so this, this phrase comes up over and over again. If you pay attention, you're going to hear it from a lot of Japanese officials. And I think they are concerned uh, that if the rules-based international order is not accessible, is not inclusive, does not give them opportunities, does not is not friendly to them, uh, that that is just going to redound to China's and Russia's benefit, that they're going to be there for them, they're going to support the development, they're going to give them those opportunities, and that it's imperative for Japan and its peers in the G7 to create that kind of more inclusive uh, global order, to make it uh, a, to still be a rules-based order, to not, but to not be exclusionary, uh, to not be quite so hierarchical in the sense of uh, keeping out or keeping down uh, the global south. And so I think this is maybe uh, the next frontier as Japan thinks about what the global rules-based order should look like. I'm gonna stop there and turn it over to my other panelists. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you, Tobias. I thought that was terrific. And I wanna reinforce one point. The fan transformation of Japan is so fundamental, so far reaching, it goes way beyond the US and Russian thinking because both sides already anticipated that there would be this kind of uh, breakdown into a kind of struggle over the world uh, right now. But what Japan did is it changed from not anticipating it to becoming a leader, it considered itself a co-leader, and it now talks about the Kishida doctrine as if this is a fundamental change for Japan, and I really think it is. We turn now to Han Hanak Kim, and please tell us what you think about South Korea. Hey, uh, thank you so much for inviting me to this panel, um, and I'm very excited to be a part of it, and I wish I could have attended in person. Um, so I, I'll be presenting on the South Korean perspective on perceptions of the liberal international order under the impact of Russia's war against Ukraine. And my presentation is based off of a working paper um, that I'm currently working on right now. Um, so as many of us know, the existing liberal international order has been challenged for decades and scholars continue to debate as to whether or not it'll be replaced by a new one. But recently, and even in the past, you know, the rise of authoritarianism has really been at the forefront of this challenge, especially when we're focusing on the liberalness of the liberal international order. So, and uh, Russia's sudden and aggressive invasion of Ukraine was has been a direct attempt to challenge not just Ukraine as, as a state, but also uh, on the democraticness of the liberal international order as well. And citizens worldwide are now reacting to this. But the Ukraine war has posed unique challenges for many different countries, but it's also posed unique challenges for South Korea because South Korea plays a very vital role in protecting and promoting democracy in East Asia, uh, considering that it's one of the only three fully consolidated democracies that are acknowledged in the region. But at the same time, Korea is also struggling with democracy, both externally and internally, through constant threats from neighboring autocracies such as China and North Korea. And it's also struggling internally, like many other democracies that we see worldwide right now with, um, that are struggling with uh, low democratic support. And so existing uh, data has shown, uh, for example, the World Value Survey has shown this kind of declining support for democracy over time. So in 1996, the World Value Survey actually showed that 83, 84% of Korean respondents were really supportive of democracy. But in the most recent wave, which was conducted in 2018, 70% of the respondents showed support for the dem um, democratic political system, which shows nearly a 14% decrease since 1996. And this is even more concerning because Korea struggled through three decades of authoritarian rule before successful democratization. And a lot of and the dem democratic process really stemmed from protests, from people power movements, through a growing civil society with people that were heavily invested and interested in politics. But we kind of see this changing over time. 
And with studies kind of showing that there's this trend towards democratic backsliding, the Ukraine war has led to more significant concerns about the shifts that may appear in the international realm regarding uh, the democraticness of the liberal international order. And um, at the very start of the Ukraine war, there were a number of different uh, articles that kind of mentioned how Korea did not really react initially to um, condoning or condemning R Russia's um, actions. And, but at the same time, we can see how this would influence not just that part of the world, but in East Asia, because we see how China could also be influenced in terms of becoming more aggressive in its attempt to absorb Taiwan or to influence its neighboring countries. So in, in order to kind of examine this further, I ended, I wanted to empirically test and observe whether support for democracy and by default also increasing support for autocracy may have changed during this time frame. Um, during the, the start of the Ukraine war. And I especially wanted to focus on how the youth view uh, changes in the liberal international order because the youth are going to be, you know, the next generation that really play a critical role in Korea's political transformations in the next few decades. And in order to empirically examine this, I ended up conducting two different surveys. One I actually did before um, Russia invaded Ukraine. So one survey I conducted in January, and then another I ended up conducting in May of last year. And in both surveys, I incorporated questions that focused on um, the liberal values and on democracy and on autocracy to see how people would um, would uh, portray their attitudes. And so um, both the January and May surveys included questions about leadership and about autocratic forms of leadership to see how people would react to this. And it, after conducting the surveys, I found that there was a high level of support for autocratic leadership. And the questions that I incorporated were questions that would show similar characteristics to how Putin has been behaving. And what the results showed was that um, support for this type of autocratic leadership was relatively high. And it was not just high up, um, in January, but it was actually even higher in May. And so if I could just very quickly just show you one of the results that I have. So this is actually data from um, the, uh, the surveys that I conducted in January and in uh, May. And I broke it down by different age cohorts to see whether or not there would be support for this type of leadership that Putin has been portraying. And not just Putin, but this type of strongman leadership that we see in a lot of autocratic uh, leaders. And what I found is that support was very high um, particularly among the youth. And so in the January data, data, the one that was conducted before Russia's invasion, we see about 19% of the respondents who, sh um, who show some support for strongman leadership. But then in May, we see that percentage jump to 40%. So nearly half of the younger respondents that were in my survey were more supportive of strongman leadership after the war in May. And I found this very concerning and also very fascinating because this was at a time in which um, the Ukraine war was getting a lot of attention and it was being condemned by political democratic political leaders worldwide. Um, so I ended up just running a quick regression to see how age would play into this. And it did show that younger Korean citizens were more likely to support this type of strongman leadership. So I think these re survey results are interesting in several ways. First, it's contrary to what's often expected. Um, and despite Russia's attack, we see these autocratic preferences initially increased at the start of the war in Korea. And the surveys show that the support is higher among younger age groups. 
So this is a bit puzzling considering that Korean citizens, regardless of party identification and ideology, um, often do show more favorable attitudes towards the democratic countries such as the United States. But they're also paradoxically showing more support for authoritarian characteristics like this type of strongman leadership. Um, but of course, I do want to mentioned that there are some limitations to my survey um, because this was conducted in May. I do believe that after uh, President Yoon suk yeol took office in May 10th, things started to shift a little bit more. Um, Yoon did provide a bit more of a hawkish uh, um, attitude towards uh, Russia and Ukraine when after he took office. Um, and public opinion may have been influenced a bit more during this time. At least up until May, we saw a bit more ambiguous and non-committal reactions towards what was happening in Ukraine. Um, scholars such as Kyuk Shin and Robert Kelly have mentioned that this kind of ambiguity and non-committal reaction may have stemmed from the fact that it was the previous administration. And because for Korean citizens, what's happening in Ukraine may have felt very far away. But once Yoon took office, things started to shift a little bit more and we saw uh, support for Putin decrease over time as well. And so I do think that this paper could be improved on with an additional survey being conducted, um, possibly even now. And then we may actually see that because of Putin's lack of success in terms of what's been happening, we could also see this kind of support decreasing over time. Um, I also do think that Yoon's meetings with President Biden have for further indicated that Korea is trying to work more closely with the United States and having a conservative party in power is also adding on to this. And these meetings may influence public opinion. So updated surveys could be helpful for future work. But the surveys do show and um, articles right at the start of the Ukraine war did show that support for the liberal international order was lacking in the beginning and that over time, Korea's democratic progress will continue to fluctuate. Um, and with Korea's democratic process, this progress, this will also influence the attitudes towards the liberal international order in the region as well. Um, so that's all I have for now. And I'd appreciate any comments or feedback. Thank you, Hannah. And thank you for drawing our attention to public opinion data and how they can be integrated into a broader study of attitudes towards the liberal international order. Uh, I think what she has shown is that Korea is at the crossroads. Japan has made its will known. Korea is edging towards bipolarity. There are very interesting developments that are occurring under the UN administration. Uh, and there's still some challenges ahead. And it was uh, very helpful to have this perspective on where Korea was at the beginning of the war and how things are beginning to change. Now let's turn to the United States and Jacques. Yeah. Right. Well, uh, thank you, Gil, and, and thanks to KEI and to our hosts here at Indiana University. I'm uh, delighted to be here. Um, I wanna suggest that the first year of the Ukraine war has been sort of a mixed bag for the international liberal order, liberal international order in Asia. Uh, and the U.S. is championing of it. I want to make three main points. Um, the first one, and, and here is where there has not been so much rethinking on the U.S. side as perhaps a sigh of relief uh, and a delighted reaffirmation. Uh, that is, we've seen successful, remarkably successful collective action by liberal states, the global north, uh, led by the U.S. and Europe, to push back against an authoritarian and illiberal aggressor that is challenging a couple of the principal norms of the international system. Uh, as, as um, we heard about earlier, uh, it's aggressive warfare against the territorial integrity and the sovereign autonomy of another state. And once the conflict got underway, we've also seen atrocities uh, that violate the laws of war. And from the U.S. perspective, uh, the response is rightly celebrated as, as a success that mobilized sanctions, albeit of somewhat limited effect, and that provided extensive and quite expensive financial and military aid, although limited by concerns about escalation, and that has held together pretty well despite some cracks here and there. This has implications for a liberal international order in Asia as well. Uh, it at least supported the idea or provided something of a proof of concept that a similar response might be possible if China were to do something analogous in Asia. And the most obvious target, of course, would be Taiwan. Uh, 
Uh, Taiwan is like Ukraine, a liberal, demo a liberal democratic polity that faces a threat from a large authoritarian neighbor that is increasingly dissatisfied with the status quo order. Uh, China regards Taiwan as lost sovereign territory, much as Putin regards Ukraine or at least parts of Ukraine. And the recovery of Taiwan uh, is something which China has clearly indicated it will seek to achieve by force if need be. And this has, of course, spawned a cottage industry in the United States about the lessons you can or cannot draw from the Ukraine conflict for a Taiwan scenario. And don't have time to go into it here, but it run just, run, runs from the highly optimistic to the highly pessimistic with some of the factors that go into the analysis being things like the Chinese military is a good deal more formidable than the Russian one turned out to be, uh, that, that Taiwan lacks some of the capacity and perhaps some of the will uh, to resist that we've seen in Ukraine and that the cost of trying to impose sanctions would be much greater for the sanctioners, uh, as well as perhaps the sanctionee in the Chinese case than in the Russian case. And we've seen also in terms of the impact in Asia, Asian states joining in, albeit to varying degrees, in imposing sanctions and isolating Russia and offering some forms of support for Ukraine. And this bodes at least somewhat well for an analogous response in the event of an analogous action by China in Asia. Uh, the Ukraine war and especially the China-Russia alignment that it produced, beginning, of course, with the time to link up to the Olympics eve of invasion, a statement of uh, limitless friendship, which does have its limits, but still is a pretty remarkable statement. Uh, it has brought Europe more into alignment with the United States views of China as a challenge and a threat to the existing liberal order. And it has led Europe to consider Asia as much more important to, much more linked to its own security interests. It's been manifested in closer cooperation and greater deployment of European military forces in the area. And again, this too bodes somewhat well for a kind of pan-global north response to possible threats to the existing order in Asia from China. And uh, there's a more unilateral effect perhaps worth noting here. Ukraine is part of the story of the strengthened US support or signals of support for Taiwan. Biden's most impactful version of his, we will defend Taiwan statement came in the context of a response to a question about is Taiwan like Ukraine? And the, the point he made is no, we're more committed uh, to using troops in a ta Taiwan scenario uh, than obviously in a Ukraine one. Uh, and, and here it's more broadly, uh, I think resonant with uh, other statements by what Biden has made in the Taiwan context. He's even gone so far as to push the sovereignty button that I was talking about earlier, uh, saying it's up to the Taiwan people to decide whether they want independence or unification. Uh, and the, the, there's been a link here between US support for Taiwan against China uh, to US supports for the rules-based international order, which in the US conception, again, is a liberal one, and we can talk about how liberal it is, but I would say it's predominantly liberal with some, some caveats here and there. My second point, and here's where there has been more rethinking, uh, is that there have been two shifts in emphasis in the U.S. approach to the liberal or rules-based international order uh, that have been accelerated by the Ukraine war. Uh, first, there's been a re-emphasis on state sovereignty or the defense of state sovereignty. This, of course, is as old a norm as there is in the international system, and it's persisted through its liberal era, but it's regained some prominence. Some prominence. Uh, this is beloved the realist school of international relations, uh, and it's, it's hung on uh, in the 20th and 21st centuries, uh, as it's been coupled increasingly with notions of self-determination of peoples and, and you know, distinct groups. Uh, and the Ukraine war, of course, attacks all of these principles. It's an attack on a sovereign state. It's an aggressive military act. Uh, and uh, Ukraine is, in Russia's view, perhaps not a sovereign state. Uh, and in Putin's view, Ukrainians are not a separate people. The Chinese position on Taiwan is, of course, quite parallel, and that's not lost on the U.S. view of the situation. Although, interestingly, China offers kind of a backhanded recognition of the power of an argument that says you shouldn't try to destroy a state or deny a people self-determination, uh, in that it says the Taiwan and Ukraine situations are completely different. Apparently, they agree with Biden on that. All right. Uh, so the war has led the U.S. and other supporters of the, of the existing order to reemphasize and re-embrace the sovereigntist strand in the international uh, liberal order. Uh, and this has some carry over to Asia, although we're not quite sure how much, um, although for, for many points that um, we've already heard and we'll hear, hear about again, uh, this is, is part of the, the mix of the discussion in Asia. Uh, and it's worth noting, I think here, that there was a certain resonance between Russia's territorial sovereignty claims against Ukraine and the fact that China has some territorial disputes uh, with uh, many of its neighbors uh, in Asia. So it, it, it has that, that echo effect and the US is certainly um, uh, not uh, uh, deaf to that phenomenon. Uh, and uh, what, what also has happened, of course, is that the Asian response to the Ukraine war 
uh, has occurred against the backdrop of developments in Asia, especially developments in Japan and its defense doctrine, which I won't uh, repeat here. Uh, it's been uh, addressed by people who are much more deeply versed in that than I am. Uh, but we see it happening, um, uh, especially in the link, I think, uh, between Japan's sense of its own security and Taiwan's security. We've seen it in the Quad uh, and other, other developments uh, in the region. The second shift, the rethink within the uh, liberal international order from the U.S. perspective, and U.S. policy here, has been to place even greater emphasis on the importance of domestic political orders or domestic system types. Uh, that is, it matters whether the other states at play are liberal democratic or authoritarian autocratic. Indeed, the US has pushed this distinction harder than probably anybody else, and that may be a source of friction. This too is a, some, is a longstanding norm, although somewhat more recently emerging. This is the stuff beloved of second image theories of international relations or liberal theories of IR. And it has its roots at least as far back as Wilson. It's in the UN charter. It probably reached its first apogee in the, uh, in the post-Cold War or its most recent apogee in the post-Cold War uh, third wave of democratization, although we see it in the Cold War as well. And now it's coming back in recent years with the U.S. emphasis, particularly under Biden, although it dates to Obama and others as well, on the alignment of democracies and the phrase that is probably used more than any other in Washington now, the like-minded states uh, that come together uh, to push back against uh, threats to the liberal international order. And the Ukraine war, again, has supercharged this part of the story. Um, Ukraine, of course, is a recently established democracy, and Zelensky and others have been quite adept and quite, um, uh, I think, you know, insistent and zealous in casting the conflict with Russia as part of a fundamental and global conflict between democracy and autocracy, and the U.S. has been quite receptive to that framing. The, um, the context of the, of the U.S.'s emphasis on a rules-based liberal order uh, supported by largely liberal states is, is an idea that, of course, extends to Asia, indeed, maybe uh, more prominent there almost than any place else prior to the war. Uh, and it's reflected in a number of phenomena that I'm sure everybody in this room knows. We've seen the Summit for Democracy. We've seen bilateral and multilateral statements with leaders of democratic states, including Japan, Korea, and the states of the G7. Um, and you know, all these, these fora have included Asians, Asians as well as Europeans. And at times, um, we've seen a straddling of support for the Ukraine, uh, Ukrainian uh, uh, you know, so Ukraine against Russia, uh, as well as Taiwan against China, and support for the liberal democratic order and a liberal order more broadly. These all get kind of mushed together. Uh, and we've seen a lot of, of the uh, framing of AUKUS and the Quad and various other arrangements where the glue for these new security alignments in Asia is partly the ideational alignment among liberal democratic states. We've seen the U.S.'s national security strategy, national defense strategy, and many, many other policy documents that portray China as one of the two big challengers, along with Russia, uh, to a liberal rules-based order, particularly in Asia, the Chinese case. And the U.S. Fr framing, of course, again, pairs China and Russia in this respect, and the link has become even more fraught with the Ukraine war and the uh, statement of alignment uh, between Russia and China, between Putin and Xi. Uh, there's been, it's been notable, I think, that the degree of cooperation with in, in the response to Russia and Ukraine at least loosely tracks the liberal democraticness of the states in Asia. So Japan's been perhaps most fully on board, India's been kind of squishily in the middle, and China's been not terribly cooperative, it's been modestly cooperative. My third and final point, and here's where more rethinking may need to happen than has happened so far in the U.S., uh, it's about the implications. Uh, we've seen notable successes in some rejiggering but we have reason to think that there's a tough road ahead. Uh, the optimism born of the initial response uh, in terms of defending the liberal order in, in Eurasia and in Asia, uh, that's all, all for the good. But the fact remains that this war started with a failure of deterrence by a liberal order. And, and US dis defense discussions now are almost overwhelmingly preoccupied by the question of deterring China and essentially deterring China from treating Taiwan the way Russia treated Ukraine. The pillar of this um, liberal international order, the UN Security Council, of course, is helpless uh, if the challenger is Russia or China. And the global South has been slow or reluctant to condemn Russia and would likely be equally slow or reluctant to join the US in condemning China in a Taiwan or other crisis scenario. Now, the good news here is that the US still gets it, I think, that she is at least so far no Putin. For all the lumping together in U.S. national security documents, there's a recognition that Putin is a revisionist actor and Russia is a revisionist state in a way that China and Xi are not, partly because of, of deep stakes in the existing order. The U.S. is, however, uh, facing a bunch of challenges with which I'll close. 
Uh, one is the U.S. is understandably concerned about the consequences of China's rising hard power. It makes China less influenceable, less deterrable, and it creates greater risk that it will essentially pull a Russia with respect to Taiwan or some other Asian scenario. Uh, in cooperation, uh, inducing other states to join with the U.S., and with a few exceptions, Japan being the most notable one, uh, would be much tougher uh, for the allies and partners in the region. The U.S. is also, of course, concerned about China's intent. Uh, like Russia-Ukraine relations before the war, think Crimea several years ago, cross-strait relations have become increasingly fraught. The Pelosi visit sent them uh, to a new fever high, uh, and we may get a, a recurrence with the McCarthy visit. Uh, and China's relations with its other neighbors, especially when territorial disputes, have been souring as well. China also poses a challenge to the liberal order, as the U.S. understands it, uh, in a couple of other ways. Uh, some of it is from within the structures. And here there are echoes of the way Russia approached Ukraine. China will and has tried to manipulate the sovereignty principle to say that an attack on Taiwan would not violate any rules. It's just dealing with the leftover civil war. It's a purely de Democrat, it's a purely internal matter and so on. Uh, it has uh, joined Putin in the view that uh, the U.S. and its allies and partners are the aggressors here, attempting to use the rules of the international order to keep China, like Russia, down. And like Russia, China, of course, again, can block not only the UN Security Council actions, but can also, with the support of states from the global south, uh, block action in almost any other institution. And the, the, ch the challenges are even broader than this. Um, and we've seen something of a, of a result that is a retrenchment of U.S. optimism about the potential reach for a liberal international order in Asia. Constructive engagement is dead. Uh, constructivist international relations theory and constructive engagement have a linguistic affinity. Uh, the idea that the U.S. policy can change China and change its international behavior, except in a narrow deterrence way, has faded. The many institutions of the liberal international order are weakened, as I noted earlier, but we also see China developing alternative institutions that could provide rival institutional bases. They haven't so far, uh, but think of the RCEP, the AIIB, uh, the BRI, and the rest of the alphabet soup with which we live. Uh, that coexists with the U.S.'s weakening of some of the pillars, of, especially the economic side of the international liberal order, like the TPP, the WTO, uh, and beyond that into non-economic realms, the U.N. Human Rights Council, all of which we bailed from in the Trump administration and have started to come back to, but the doubts are still there. In sum, and with this all closed, uh, the U.S.-China relationship has headed toward a more nearly peer competition that is more adversarial and more ideologically tinged. That is the framing with which the U.S. comes to the defense or promotion of a liberal order or preservation of a liberal order in Asia, uh, and the Ukraine war has accelerated all those trends. So again, so far, the first year has had mixed implications for the always challenging agenda for the U.S. of promoting a liberal rules-based international order in Asia and securing the necessary support for that order from allies, friends, partners, and more skeptical states in the region. Thanks. Thank you, Jacques. This is a paper that really frames the overall approach that is being taken in the set of four papers. It is the lead off paper as we bring together understanding and it fits very well with the fact that the United States has become the champion of this order, redefining it, leading a coalition of countries in a multilateral approach to try to preserve this order. And so we've gone through uh, Japan to a degree and talked about South Korea. Now we'll begin to raise questions about the challenges to the order more specifically, beginning with uh, Kazakhstan and the Sino-Russian context. I turn now to Gaia. Uh, thank you, Gil. Um, so my presentation, is that too loud? No, it's okay. Okay. My presentation is titled Central Asia Over a Decade, The Shifting Balance in Central Asia Between Russia and China. And this is based on an article I published recently in the Assam Forum. So uh, I would argue then Central Asia is really a testing ground um, and a competitive testing ground for China's Sinocentric Belt and Road Initiative, the BRI, and Russia's a Russo-centric uh, idea of a greater Eurasian partnership. And they're, they're very competitive with each other and um, trying to hedge each other. And Central Asia is very important to both of them. Uh, Putin, in his turn to the East, needs Central Asia as its base for him to turn to the East and the greater Eurasian partnership as the framework 
uh, and this partnership supposedly extends from Europe to East Asia with Moscow as the leader. Although the number of countries that want to be part of it, um, it's very difficult to say how many countries are actually in the Greater Eurasian Partnership. The uh, Kazakhstan is very important for the Belt and Road's uh, six corridors. One of the corridors goes through Kazakhstan to Europe. So it's not just Central Asia, but it's also um, a railroad link to uh, Europe as well. So it's very important to both Moscow and Beijing. And they are in competition, but they also have a process of adaptation uh, because they do want to have a stable Eurasian regional order. What they do agree to is they want to block the West from um, being in Central Asia whatsoever. So Beijing realizing this competition came up with a, a narrative called the division of labor, the Central Asian division of labor, where Russia can be uh, a leadership a leader in security issues, and China will be the leader in economic issues. And this is meant to mitigate any kind of competition and to ease Russian fears. And I think the Chinese are very good at playing uh, Putin, and they're playing him when they say that Russia is the, one of the leaders in Central Asia. They're, they're playing up to his, his ego. So this would allow them, this division of labor then allows them to coexist in Central Asia. Um, the problem is that the Belt and Road and the Greater Eurasian Partnership have never really linked up. They signed an agreement in 2015 that they would link the projects, um, the Eurasian Economic Union and the Belt and Road. But they've only linked it really rhetorically. and so. By now, in the last few years, they have um, decided that there's a parallel and coordinated development between these two projects, but they don't really talk about it being linked so much. In this discussion between major powers and this narrative they have about major powers in international politics, the, they don't really think about middle powers or secondary states in Central Asia. They completely overlook it. They feel that uh, countries like Kazakhstan don't have any agency or any autonomy. And when we look at Kazakhstan, we see that it uses multivectorism. It goes in many different directions. It cultivates relations with China, Russia, uh, the United States, Europe, Middle East, um, Turkey. It's constantly cultivating relations in many different directions. And they have many different strategies, hard and soft balancing, blackmail, leash slipping, neutrality, binding, and bandwagoning. They're not always hostile towards China or Russia. Sometimes they bandwagon with them. Um, and a lot of this gets played out in regional organizations. Now, in 2021, it seemed as if Beijing wanted a more exclusive relationship with Kazakhstan under the Belt and Road than it was getting. And so a lot of pressure was put on Kazakhstan in 2021. Uh, the Chinese foreign minister, Wang Yi, demanded better coordination between their development plans, that they felt Kazakhstan's development plan wasn't coordinating very well with China's development plan, their five-year development plans. And the Vice Premier Han Zheng uh, demanded better implementation of some of the agreements. And we find this true everywhere in the Belt and Road. A lot of agreements get signed, not everything gets implemented. Um, so they were putting more pressure on Kazakhstan to be more into a Chinese sphere of influence. Um, at that time, then, the Kazakh China experts uh, were worried that Kazakhstan was becoming more dependent on China as Beijing became uh, more increasingly assertive, that the more dependent Kazakhstan was, the more assertive China became. The one place to see how uh, Beijing-Moscow relations uh, play out is in regional organizations. Um, 
and also how this gives secondary states opportunities and political space to actually exercise some agency. So the first organization I chose was the Shanghai Cooperation Organization in 2022. Putin and Xi, uh, prior to the meeting, um, pledged to coordinate their positions at the SCO and present a unified leadership. What Putin was hoping that would happen at the SCO is that Russia's leadership image would be improved. Uh, its world image, its regional image would be much more improved. But actually his stature was greatly diminished at that organization. Other leaders kept him waiting on TV cameras so you couldn't hide it. Uh, he wasn't greeted at the airport by the Uzbek leader. Uzbekistan is where the meeting was held. Xi Jinping voiced questions and concerns about his uh, Ukraine invasion. And the Central Asian uh, CSGO members refused to participate in the Ukraine invasion. So, but most seriously probably was that Xi Jinping promoted the China's Global Security Initiative, the GSI, basically promoting China's security leadership in Central Asia. And by implication, marginalizing Russia's security role. And central analysts also noted that the uh, Sino-Russian Division of Labor in Central Asia was fading, was dis dissipating, that Russia is not doing its job anymore in Central Asia maintaining security. It has shown that it is unable or unwilling to protect the region. The Samarkand Declaration that came out of the meeting uh, stated that the member states considered Central Asia to be the core of the SCO and challenging the presumed leadership role of China and Russia. And that's actually a very remarkable statement because everyone thinks that the SCO is really a Chinese organization. And I think the Chinese really think that the SCO is a Chinese organization. And a few years ago, Xi Jinping tried to pull the SCO into the Belt and Road Initiative. Um, there were some members who agreed to it, but I think India vetoed it. And they, India refused. India doesn't belong to the Belt and Road Initiative. So um, the Samarkand Declaration uh, talked about sovereignty, independence, territorial integrity, non-interference in internal affairs, non-use of uh, force. So basically this was a criticism of Russia and Putin's invasion of Ukraine. The other organization I looked at is called uh, CICA, C-I-C-A, the Conference on Interaction and Confidence Building Measures in Asia. Actually, the first time I ever heard about it is when I was uh, teaching in China. A Chinese colleague told me about it because China was hosting it. And the way he talked about it, I assumed that it was a Chinese organization, actually, because the theme that year when China hosted was Asia for Asians. But actually, uh, Kazakhstan initiated it in 1992, which is that I had never heard about it before. And Kazakhstan hosted it again in 2022. And what Tokayev, the president of Kazakhstan, hoped to do was to elevate the stature of SICA to be an organization that could promote Asian collective security and Asian OSCE. Again, um, a rejection of the idea that Russia is the guarantor of security in Central Asia. Putin, when he presented at SICA, he tried to hijack it. He talked about um, his three decade old golden billion conspiracy. It's a theory regarding the United States and financial interests of the United States. He was trying to warn uh, Kazakhstan not to develop relations with the United States. He asked Zika countries to ignore the sanctions that were placed on Russian oil exports. 
He implied that Zika could become part of the Greater Eurasian Partnership. And he would link uh, the SCO, the EEU, all within uh, the Greater Eurasian Partnership. He said that Moscow and Beijing had drafted a statement on security, which they expected SICA members to approve. So Putin had assumed that Russia had an important leadership position in SICA, and he discouraged Central Asian countries from their multi-vector foreign policies, which go in all different directions. Um, but this just seemed totally irrelevant to the summit. And in fact, I don't know what happened to his statement on security. There was never any mention of it again, and the Kremlin didn't mention it either. So basically, it just fell on deaf ears. Dukaya focused on CBMs, economic development, and he celebrated Kazakhstan's leadership of SICA. He did not take a bilateral meeting with Putin. He had initiated a new form of meeting with Russia, and it's called the five plus one format, where the five Central Asian countries meet with Russia collectively. And the purpose of that, of course, is that then um, the Central Asian countries can be more unified in their interaction with Russia. Russia would prefer to pick off each individual country, right? Russia would be the bigger country dealing with each individual country. But in the five plus one format, now it's a different way of interacting with Russia. So Sika adopted the Astana statement um, with all the priority areas that Tokayev had promoted. And I didn't see any mention of uh, what Putin had promoted. So these meetings in 2022, uh, the SCO and SICA, uh, they revealed that the Central Asian states are seeking greater agency over Central Asia's relations with the world um, as middle powers. They're not major powers, they're middle powers, they're secondary states, but collectively perhaps they can do more than they could individually. And they've really rejected Sino-Russian joint hegemony over Central Asia. So what we're seeing then is the Sino-Russian division of labor that we've assumed for so long, the past decade, is less viable and possibly not even recognized by Central Asia anymore. So China still has economic leadership in the Belt and Road Initiative because that fits very much with Central Asian countries' um, economic development. That's what they are interested in. But Russian leadership of Central Asian security seems to have been rejected because they're very fearful that they'll be the next target of a Russian invasion, especially Kazakhstan, because um, the Putin narrative about a country not really being a country has been applied to Ukraine. It's also been applied to Kazakhstan. The northern part of Kazakhstan has a, a large Russian population. And so Putin has said many times, well, I don't think um, Kazakhstan is a real nation state. And he's also been very concerned about emphasis on the Kazakh language and um, less emphasis on the Russian language. He, he fears that without, without the language, then they won't be part of the Russian world. So, so anyway, um, I actually see three narratives there in Central Asia. I see the Chinese narrative, the Russian narrative, and a Central Asian narrative that we normally don't hear very much. But if you look at some of these regional meetings, you can definitely see the outlines of the Central Asian narrative and what direction they're going in. And it's still very much multi-vectorism. And I guess I'll stop there. Thank you very much, Gaia. Um, that was terrific. And you'll hear from my comments, drawing on uh, the paper currently with Katie Stollard, uh, as well as the book I've been working on with Gaia, how much I've been influenced by, by her thinking. Uh, so I want to talk about Sino-Russian relations. And I think this is particularly important for the whole region because they have not been well understood if you look at South Korean writings, 
or Japanese writings, they really don't capture in the details of what's going on in this relationship for year after year. It's a fascinating relationship with lots of ups and downs over the last 10 years since Putin declared Russia's turn to the East. And so I've divided the relations, the coverage of the Sino-Russian uh, framework uh, against the international liberal order into three parts. Part one is the way they see the strategic triangle, the grand triangle that was so widely discussed in the 1980s, China, the Soviet Union, or Russia, and the United States. So that is extremely important in the thinking of particularly of Russia, but of China to some degree as well. The second framework is the what Guy has been discussing in the Central Asian context, but I'm thinking about it more broadly here. And that is the contrast between the Belt and Road Initiative and China's sinocentric hub and spokes approach to relations with countries uh, in Asia and the Russian uh, Greater Eurasian Partnership and broader framework, continental framework, rather than China's more maritime framework of the uh, development of a new international order, which they consider a Eurasian order. So that's part two to think in terms of how they're working out their frameworks for dealing with Asian reorganization. And the third framework is really this bilateral relationship between China and Russia, how they get along and how that fits into their approach to the international order. So I'll start with the, the grand strategic triangle and give a, an overview of that and then move on to the other uh, frameworks. So in this triangle, <clears throat> Russia wants to be the pivot. It wants to be very close to China, but also to have China and Russia strongly against the United States and the United States forced to uh, treat Russia as if it has to be taken seriously the way the United States took China seriously in the 1970s. Uh, so to what extent do China and Russia agree on, on this triangle? The fact is they agree to some degree and they came closer to agreeing on it around 2019. The Russians were convinced that the Chinese were becoming so angry with Trump, the trade war, the new US thinking about Taiwan and so on, that China was developing the same revisionist framework to the world order that Russia already had. Russia was talking about a cold war for many years. They've assumed we're in a cold war. China only talked about the U.S.'s Cold War mentality, blaming Cold War possibilities on thinking in the U.S. that China did not share, although to a great extent, China was inching closer to a, a perspective where it also saw a Cold War emerging. Uh, so Russia got more confident. But at the time Russia got more confident, it also was worried because it saw the growing asymmetry and that China wouldn't take Russia very seriously in this troika, in this three-way context. And as a result, China would do what it wanted and it wouldn't really pay much attention to Russia. Russia needed to do something to awaken China to their common approach to this triangle so that it took Russia much more seriously. I think that was a big cause of the Ukraine war. I think Russia was thinking about its relationship with China becoming uh, out of sync, in danger. There were too many problems. And I'll talk about some of them in the next two contexts. And therefore, it had to oh, shake up the triangle. And by if it won a quick victory in Ukraine, and Ukraine became part of the Eurasian economic 
union or community. And Ukraine was, Russia was now seen as a more substantial power, more challenging to the West as China was getting more serious about the Taiwan crisis and tensions, then Russia would have to be taken much more seriously by China. So I think that triangle is a very important thing, but now Russia's position because of the war is considerably weakened in the triangle. It's more dependent on China by far. It, uh, it has a weaker position in dealing with the West. Its economic ties to Europe are, are in great difficulty. And so uh, th this backfired from the strategic triangle point of view. Uh, and China right now isn't so inclined to act with the kind of speed that Russia anticipated. Uh, it strongly backs Russian thinking about the nature of the triangle and the nature of the causes that drove Russia to war in Ukraine. NATO expansion, similar to US alliance expansion in Asia, all of which are a sign of the containment and US Cold War thinking. But Russia is uh, not in a good position to gain leverage against China in this triangle frame, triangular framework. And right now, at least, Xi Jinping seems to want to buy some time and improve some relations, including with some of the countries that are his neighbors, such as Japan, uh, but that uh, may be uh, in trouble uh, due to the balloon incident uh, this past week. Let's turn to the second dimension. And here we see uh, over the last 10 years, Russia's turn to the East has repeatedly redefined the Sino-Russian relationship in the context of Asia. What would China do in relation to Russia's increasing interest in Asia? Well, before the Crimean uh, annexation, uh, Russia was talking about multilateralism and even Japan and South Korea as partners in this Eurasian uh, initiative and its turn. Uh, but that changed. It became more focused on ties to China. And we've gone through other stages since then. I won't belabor the point. But basically, Russia has been trying to get a framework that China would agree to and that China has accepted the, Eura the greater Eurasian partnership, um, paid lip service to it. But China has done things that have undermined Russia's strategy. I'll give a few examples. Russia was counting on India, the number one country besides China in Russia's turn to the east. And China initiated a border clash with India that turned India much more hostile and reinforced India's ties to the United States and Japan with the Quad. So this was not to Russia's liking, and they were put in a difficult situation. They could not um, mediate between the two. They met in uh, triangular meetings, and it, they were rather disastrous. The second thing is ASEAN centrality. Russia counted on ASEAN as a unit being a significant actor in Asia. And in fact, China has undermined ASEAN centrality while paying lip service to it. And uh, that doesn't work in Russia's interest. Another one is the Northern Sea Route. Uh, a guy has written about this Russian approach to the, to, to the Far East. China has sought a, an open uh, transportation, freedom of navigation in the Northern Sea Route. And Russia has said, no, this is our territory. We want you to join on our terms. Uh, so they haven't really agreed on that. So this has been a real problem because they want to build a new order of the world separate from the international uh, order of the liberal international order. And they want it to be centered in Asia and they want it to go through the SCO and so on. And yet they've had so much difficulty figuring out how to do that because of this cat and mouse game where Russia does one thing, China does something else. They don't coordinate. And then they have to figure out 
how they can make sure they don't allow this to really damage their relationship. The third is the Sino-Russian bond. And I regard that as even weaker than their cooperation on the regional level. Uh, I mentioned various signs of hollowness in this relationship. They have no shared vision of a future order, except for platitudes about um, certain things and against the US. History is in the background with the potential to spark a clash uh, should nationalist forces in either side so desire. And if Russia offends China, you can be sure the history issue will come right to the forefront. Uh, their personal exchanges, even separate from the fact that COVID has damaged their cross-border ties immensely, are very minimal. There are very little going on except for the formal formulaic linkages. Um, and so I really don't think there's a, a strong bond between the two. However, the Ukraine war has showcased their consensus on the overall grand strategic triangle as the crux of understanding the international order. And it's overwhelmed their different views on regional order and bilateral relations. So I would say their alignment is stable right now, underpinned by complementary but not identical views of values, security concerns, and economic priorities. But both will pursue their own separate interests and they have very serious challenges that they still must face. Okay, we stop our presentations and look forward to your comments and questions. Um, please. So we have uh, viewers online and obviously folks um, in here. So if you have a question here, please raise your hand. We'll bring the mic to you. I see multiple questions. Uh, okay. Thank you very much for really interesting talks. I'm Gardner Bowden, Central Eurasian Studies and International Studies. Um, Professor Jalil, I was really interested in one of the remarks you made that I think set the stage for a lot of this. You suggested that Russia is a revisionist power, and by implication that China is not. We all know that John Mearsheimer traveled around the world on his China as a revisionist power speech. Are you suggesting that he was just wrong from the get go or has a more aggressive Putin shoved aside China's revisionist dreams in favor of more powerful weaponized Russian revisionism? Are we answering them in, in sympathy? Yeah, uh, I, I wouldn't call China not revisionist, but I, I think it is, uh, you know, Yes, I would agree with the the uh, premise of your question, which is Russia is you know out there to break things basically, uh, and that that China ha has discontent and would like to th see things change. But at least for now, its cost benefit analysis is to push around the edges, challenge, uh, create options. I think a lot of what China is doing is creating options so that if it doesn't get accommodated in the way it wants to get, or uh, if the U.S. continues in its view to try to keep China down, it has a route out. So I think if you look at the institutional structures that China has created, so far they've played mostly by the rules, AIB uh, very much so, uh, RCEP not worse than most of the decreasingly liberal structures. I mean, CPTPP is actually good news in this area, but you know, but trade has a lot of those kinds of, of things. That, and, um, you know, BRI is, is I think, you know, so inchoate and, and, and fragmented as not really to do much. Um, so you don't really, but they are potentially options. And you see China essentially trying to uh, mitigate the risk of dependence on the U.S. That's the Chinese side of decoupling. But I don't think they've crossed that threshold yet. Uh, I don't think they're anywhere near where Putin is. What I worry about is the Taiwan scenario pushes them over that edge. Uh, that uh, they clearly have a hair trigger for that. And I don't know if that's because they know something we don't um, about what's likely to happen, or whether they go to DEFCON one on pretty much, uh, you know, a, a minor provocation. But but for now, China has so much more to lose, and I think that that's what's keeping a degree of stability. Is sanctioning would be much harder from our side. It would also be very painful for them, and so they will they will try to do some reworking, perhaps some radical reworking. But for now, they're nowhere near where Russia is. I just want to add one thing. And that is that I think China's response to the Ukraine war has changed its view of the liberal order substantially. 
because it supports the thinking of Russia, which denies the sovereignty and territorial integrity of a country. That is a sharp attack on the one of the most fundamental principles of this order. And so I regard this, that it's really China and Japan have changed substantially because of this war, whereas the United States and Russia were already inclined to think along some of the same lines. Just quickly, for anyone who's watching online, if you do have a question, feel free to, to put it in the Q&A and we will get to it uh, as we move along. Uh, I'm Nick Cullither. I'm the interim dean of the Hamilton Luger School. I just wanted to ask uh, uh, for your prognostications in the event, which seems likely now, that Ukraine turns into a prolonged stalemate. Uh, how does that affect um, the politics of, of, of these various situations, the trends that you've observed. Um, I mean, I, I would just one angle, I mean, this is just one way of thinking about it that I think, um, you know, certainly I think one kind of relatively unstated concern that you would find in Japan with the circumstances, um, you know, they don't want the United States overly focused on Europe. You know, they want the, you know, they, you know, if the, if the United States is overly focused on a conflict in Europe and is diverting resources from, you know, we've seen, you know, it, it's uh, moved equipment that was in South Korea to, uh, to Europe, you know, that, that if that's where the U.S. focus is, that is not in Japan's interest. You know, that, and, and I think, you know, in general, I think um, there's probably no bigger fan in the world than uh, of NATO stepping up and NATO members doing more um, other than the United States than, you know, Japan would love for them to step up and to not need the United States to be there as much. Um, you know, other, you know, it was front page news in every newspaper when Germany decided that it was, finally that it was going to send tanks. Um, so, you know, Japan is watching very closely what Europeans are doing. Uh, but if this ends up being a stalemate and if this remains something the United States has to keep, um, you know, its attention firmly fixed on, I think that is going to cause some anxiety in Asia, I mean, it just has to. I mean, the United States just has limited bandwidth, uh, limited resources, as we're seeing. You know, the, the the strains on the defense industrial base in the United States. Sure, that's a, a source of anxiety, uh, not just in Japan and the region. So, I, I mean, I think I think that is an absolute concern and something that um, the longer this goes on, that's going to be watched uh, closely in the region. William, briefly on that. I, I think in terms of, of threats to you know, the state-based and the rest of the liberal order, Ukraine doesn't have to win. It just has not to lose. Uh, and so a stalemate kind of works, although it's tragic for Ukrainians. It, it kind of works for U.S. and liberal interests. Uh, but I, I, I do think the, the, from a, a sort of U.S.-China friction perspective, there is a lot of talk in China about the U.S. once again has failed to pivot. You know, we're always going to pivot to Asia. It's always just over the horizon. But then something else comes up. It's 9-11. It's the Middle East. It's now Ukraine. And so there's a little bit of a sense there that we're you know, not as fully engaged uh, as we might be. And that gives, uh, gives them some breathing room. that the Chinese have been uh, rethinking everything um, and discussing, and I don't know where that's going to end up, but they realize they overestimated Russia and Russia's military ability, and um, they've underestimated the United States and the unity of the West. And um, they think that maybe the U.S. isn't declining as much as they thought the U.S. was declining. I've collected a very large Chinese literature on believing uh, China's rising, the U.S. is declining. And I, I would put a lot of blame for that belief system on uh, Wang Huning, who is an advisor to Xi Jinping. And so his views really prevail. And he believes that the U.S. is declining, China is rising. And sure, China is rising, the U.S. Um, relatively speaking, um, other other countries are rising, but uh, it's it's a very strong ideological belief. But now it's being tested and and reevaluated that maybe the U.S. isn't really declining as much as they thought. Um, so that the if the war goes on longer, I think uh, the Chinese view of Russia will probably get will decline also. Um, 
I read in the newspaper that the US government thinks that China is supporting um, militarily or dual use technology supporting Russia in some way that we can't really see or track. But I, I haven't really seen what the evidence for that is. For the most part, I think the Chinese really um, disapprove of this chaos. They really, this isn't their idea of world order or how to manage things at all. Um, so that's, I guess that's what I have to say. I want to add a dimension that we haven't really discussed, which I think is very important for answering this question. The US has shown extraordinary leadership and its leadership is links Russia and China. And in fact, uh, with regard to economic security, the term of the year, now economics and security are not two separate concepts. They are very closely linked. Uh, with regard to that, the US has pushed an approach which applies to Russia very heavily and immediately, but applies to China in a more serious long-term way. And so if you look at some of the moves taken by the Biden administration to uh, change the way we are dealing with China economically, uh, export controls, controls on investments, new controls on investments into China now, uh, just being discussed. I think the war drags on. This is the overall framework with which the U.S. approaches it. The U.S. is not sending troops into the war, but it's heavily involved in the economic management of the order that transforms the war, beginning with sanctions on Russia, but leading to a fundamental change in the way the international order handles economics plus security. Anna, do you want to add? Um, yeah, um, so I, I, I think I really agree with the statement that Ukraine doesn't have to win, just doesn't have to lose. Um, in the case of Korea, you know, when the Ukraine war started, there was a lot of focus on how quickly Putin and Russia would win. But because the stalemate, because of this ongoing situation, um, this idea of Putin being this very strong leader, this idea of Russia being able to win quickly slowly started to fade and it just led to less um, less confidence in terms of that type of leadership. Um, and so in a way, um, in the case of Korea as well, it did kind of lead to uh, beliefs that this lib the liberal the existing liberal international order is relatively strong and that because it's so strong uh, you know it has kind of led to the situation so it's similar to um i think in the cases of japan um that it it does seem to be kind of working in its favor Hi, I'm Shruti Rana, assistant dean here at the Hamilton Luger School. Um, so my question was for Professor Kim and to some extent, Professor Harris. And um, so Professor Kim, I was really struck by your data on the appeal of strongmen in Korea. And I was wondering um, what differences you found in the responses by gender and also um, what role the kind of gender conflicts in the country are playing um, in this appeal. And my the backdrop to this question is um, that one of the ways that we've seen states signal their disengagement with the rules based international order, or at least the liberal part of it is to withdraw from gender equality provisions and standards like the Istanbul Convention and Russia has been doing a lot in that regard as well. And, um, and I know both South Korea and Japan are facing really contentious debates about women's participation in the workplace, advancement in the workplace, falling birth rates, reproductive rights, and LGBTQ rights. So I was just wondering how you saw that playing into um, those internal struggles, playing into the external engagement with the rules-based international order. Yes, uh, thank you so much for that question. Um, it, it gender definitely does play a role. Um, when I when I start to look more into the data, you can see that there 
it's not just younger generations that are very supportive of the strong men type of leadership or show more preferences towards these autocratic tendencies. It's usually younger male respondents who show these different, who show support for this. And um, it's kind of, it works in line with this ongoing kind of alt-right movement that you see among younger men in Korea as well. And so um, in the actual surveys, I actually run a few experiments to see whether or not um, these uh, strongman leaders make statements regarding gender and how that kind of plays into it. And you definitely see that there is this gender gap um, in terms of preferences for autocratic tendencies. Um, there are there is a certain percentage of younger women who also do show support for this, but it's usually older women who are much more likely to show these types of um, autocratic tendencies. But that usually stems from more uh, issues related to authoritarian nostalgia rather than this kind of new movement that's happening. So there definitely is this gender gap um, when it comes to this lack of support for that democratic values and the existing liberal international order. Um, so, I mean, I'll, I'll just say your Japan, you know, probably for the last 15 or 20 years, of course, you know, has talked about values diplomacy has increasingly uh, included the promotion of universal values as a foreign policy goal. Um, at times, I'd say maybe even more often than not, this feels like a cudgel against you know, whether it's China, whether it's North Korea, you know, trying to, you know, you know, we stand for this and you don't. Um, and so Japan is not always, I think, conceived of, you know, certainly when it thinks as, you know, and as I, as I talked about, when it thinks about rules-based international order, oftentimes it's thinking about more material things, think about its economic interests, think about security, think about maritime security. Generally, um, it, it just does not necessarily feel comfortable about it. Talking about universal values is one thing, but actually um, putting uh, resources behind it, really your muscle behind promoting uh, universal values is something that I think it has been less comfortable with. It's generally not uh, what it tries to do when it goes overseas um, you know, in its development decisions. It's just not what it's done. Um, and I mean, in some ways it's, it's a shame and maybe a missed opportunity. And I think actually um, one thing we're seeing uh, quietly during the run-up to the G7. We're seeing this domestically and maybe less visibly internationally, pressure on Japan on, on uh, LGBT rights, which, you know, of course, it's something where, you know, does not have uh, same-sex marriage or same-sex partnership recognized by law. That, uh, and we are now in the midst of a, of a pretty contentious domestic debate after a uh, advisor to the prime minister was supposed to re re resign after some uh, pretty galling homophobic remarks. And so there's some pressure domestically on the prime minister, but also I think quietly other governments have been trying to nudge Japan on this front, but it's not some, they're just not comfortable with it. It's not something they've, um, you know, maybe maybe more on gender equality, but again, there's the hypocrisy issue where the progress at home has been lagging. So I, I think there's an uneasiness, you know, that they don't necessarily see a rules-based order as a force for kind of progressive change globally. And certainly not something that Japan um, is in the lead of, of promoting. and and. It's, it's maybe a blind spot, but it's, I think, the reality of how they've approached uh, their foreign policy. I could add just one footnote to that. Taiwan's a real outlier in this story. That is, it has pushed very hard its democratic accomplishments. It's pushed the human rights story, having a female president, having same-sex marriage, uh, you know, being at the forefront of all that. And it, it's, it, it, it sees that values argument out there and is playing strongly to it. Um, you know, it's a, that, that's a fact it's done for domestic reasons, but it's important to its international status. Sung-Gyung, we've got one question online. It wouldn't be a truly hybrid event if we didn't at least take one. So, um, uh, and this brings up the issue of North Korea, which has been touched on, but uh, it's probably worth focus. It is hard to see that the two Koreas will not ultimately come closer together since they have the historical ties and no and and deep distrust or no deep trust, excuse me, of China. How does China and Russia see North Korea in their new world order? They like North Korea as a buffer. Will they act to enforce it? I, I will try to give a response to that. I've been looking at Chinese and Russian views of North Korea and South Korea for quite some time. I argued uh, 20 years ago that there were no, when the six party talks began, 
there was no consensus of five versus one, the way George Bush said, we had a, a, a possibility of solving this problem, that neither China nor Russia agreed with the uh, general understanding of North Korea and the approach to denuclearization that was being advocated by uh, the other countries, sometimes by South Korea, uh, not very much so by Japan and the United States. So they, they've also pushed hard on the Korean War in recent years, strongly defending North Korea for its involvement in the Korean War. It did the right thing. It was one of the first battles against an effort by the United States to overturn the post-Cold War framework. And so if you read Chinese and Russian writings on the Korean War, there's no hope anymore, unlike the 1990s, when in both countries you could find some debate uh, on this issue. There's no hope anymore that they would turn against North Korea. And in fact, since the collapse of the, um, the Hanoi summit, China and Russia refused to cooperate in the United Nations with new sanctions on North Korea and had been writing defensively about North Korea. And it's, excuse me, excuse me, it's the United States' fault. And South Korea is just a vassal state going along with the U.S., even under Moon, for its policy towards North Korea. And so I don't see any prospect that we're going to get cooperation from Beijing or Moscow in the uh, in the foreseeable future in managing North Korea, where uh, the potential for a more serious crisis is growing pretty rapidly. Good evening. Um, my question is related to the uh, the chip ban on China and what you see like the implications for that would be specifically relating to uh, you know the threats on uh, Chinese economic security, as you mentioned. Also, does this further push China away from the liberal economic order? And also, does this potentially affect Chinese, you know, timeline or analysis with regards to Taiwan, uh, considering that they have such a great chip economy? Um, I think it's more a uh, symptom than cause. Uh, that is the, you know, the, the China's concern with the weaponization of economic dependence has been growing for a while. Uh, the, the October surprise, as it were, on, on how, how, how far the, the chip technology thing went, I think was, was um, more than expected, uh, but it's it's a step along that road. Uh, you know, the short term it, it puts China in a difficult position, but you know, again, they've seen it coming. The the Trump era moves against Huawei and ZTE were sort of shots across the bow. This is a, a bigger and in some ways more targeted one, but it, it, it in the long run will accelerate China's pursuit of technological self reliance. In the short run, it makes them more vulnerable because he can't get there overnight. Um, I don't think it changes the Taiwan timeline particularly. I mean, TSMC will be one of the first casualties if the shooting starts. Uh, there's a debate in Taiwan over who's going to bomb the TSMC factory, but um, not through them. Uh, but, you know, it's, it's uh, if you get to a point of a conflict scenario over Taiwan, we got bigger problems than, than lack of, of chip supplies. Uh, so I think, you know, the U.S. economic security or, or securitization of economic issues, clearly it's, it's a move short term. It helps long term. It just pushes China faster down a path it wants to be on. But yeah, that may be a trade-off worth making. So uh, my name is Russell Burge and I teach on modern Korean history here at IU. I apologize, but I'm going to direct again a question at professors Kim and Harris, uh, which is, um, you know, one of the things that characterizes liberal democracies is debate. Um, and I'm very curious, you know, both the Kishida government and the Yoon government are relatively new administrations. Um, and I'm curious, what kind of debate have we seen around their handling um, of the Ukraine crisis? Um, particularly these quite, you know, there are these quite dramatic shifts we're seeing in Japan. What kind of public debate has there been in that regard? And also, you know, in South Korea, is the response to Ukraine emerging as a kind of partisan issue in any way? Are there any kind of political fault lines? I'm curious to hear your thoughts as observers of these countries. 
Uh, should I go first? Oh, okay. Um, so yeah, thanks for that question. Um, you know, uh, when it comes to debates regarding Ukraine, the, the interesting thing is that the start of the Ukraine war started at the same time as the presidential elections in South Korea. And because of that, it was part of the presidential debates throughout um, February. And um, one of the things that um, Lee Jae-myung, who was the other um, political, the opposition candidate, but one of the things that Lee Jae-myung was saying was that President Yoon would not be able to handle things happening in terms of foreign policy because he doesn't have experience with it, because he doesn't have a lot of, he doesn't have political, a political background in that sense. So from the very beginning of his uh, administration, uh, even before his inauguration, the Ukraine war continued to be this kind of question about his ability with foreign policy. Um, but but President Yoon, after take, after being inaugurated on May 10th, he has led a relatively hawkish stance when it comes to Russia and when it comes to um, providing aid and assistance to Ukraine. And I think this past October, um, uh, Putin essentially threatened President Yoon by saying, if you provide any type of uh, non-humanitarian assistance, then um, how would you feel if, we're, if we support North Korea? And so there was this kind of um, threatening situation, but President Yoon has been walking this fine line between trying to provide humanitarian aid, but also at the same time trying to show that he is working with the US to protect the liberal uh, international order. So in a way, it, I don't think he's had enough room for multiple debates, but he has to a certain extent been trying to have lead a relatively more hawkish stance towards Russia than uh, the Democratic Party did initially between February up until May 10th. So um, on the Japan side, I would, it's less, I think, about a question of debate and more about um, the role public opinion has played in everything we've seen over the last year. Um, you know, Japan is a, you know, for all those sort of doubts about its the quality of its democracy as a country where the politicians, including the LDP, uh, for all of its electoral victories, takes public opinion very seriously. And public opinion polls do define the shape of what's possible. And so, I mean, it is very different. I mean, although Kishida, when he be first became prime minister, hinted that he might want to do counter-strike capabilities or, or raise defense spending, it's very hard to imagine things taking the form that they have taken without the public basically being on board with it. And um, a number of people have remarked basically that you've seen no protests in Tokyo. You know, you compare to what happened in 2015 where uh, the Abe government pushed through uh, controversial national security reforms and you had massive protests. There's been nothing, uh, nothing at all like that. I mean, really nothing. I mean, I don't, maybe there have been, you know, dozens, you know protests of dozens of people, but certainly nothing, uh, nothing like what you saw in 2015. And I mean, it really reflects that the, the public mindset has changed over the last year that there was something and, and I think um, some of it I think comes down to uh, how the war in Ukraine was seen in Japan certainly in its early stages and how it was presented in the Japanese media that I think there was a I think the, the visceral impact of the images of that war on Japanese public thinking and then and then I think you ended up with sort of national security experts who aren't always getting mainstream media coverage explaining putting it in context explaining the you know the implication for Japan's security more directly um, so the public public really shifted I mean you look at opinion polls the public's support for uh, spending more on defense over the last you know, year uh, has been very consistent a very solid majority consistently now of course it gets more complicated when you ask how to pay for it because no one wants taxes to go up and no one wants to see other spending cuts so it's complicated um, but it's a basic level that i think uh, the debate was shaped essentially by the public saying you know we see we see the dangers out in the world you know we've been hearing politicians talking about this for a while now we get it now we understand what's at risk um, and, and so that i think has defined uh, the choices that were available to the kishida government there's still there's still going to be plenty of debate about uh, what exact what form Japan's response to this new world looks like um, and, and how to pay for it. And that's going to be very heated going forward. And that's you know, the political system doing the thing it's supposed to do. Uh, but at, at a basic level, uh, public opinion, I think, was was a major enabling factor over the last year. I want to add something to that. Um, the uh, Japan and South Korea as democratic countries have lively debates in their press. 
and you can find lots of articles criticizing their policies towards the United States and towards Russia, Ukraine. Um, not, they're not the mainstream, but you can find them, Korea more so, because Korea has a stronger uh, opposition movement uh, than Japan. But in Japan, I can think of five or more authors who are very active in criticizing the war. Uh, and Japan's participation in it. So that's a nice thing about those countries, that we do have that kind of uh, open uh, liberal uh, debate atmosphere, even if there are some people who are opposed to the defense of the, the liberal order in this fashion. So the other uh, democratic state in East or Northeast Asia that has not been mentioned once thus far is Mongolia. Mm. And I'm wondering if any of you have thought about Mongolia's possible position vis-a-vis -vis China and Russia. Uh, it's noteworthy that the Mongolian government uh, in the last few years has tried to really position itself as a kind of kind of a revived non-aligned status. Any thoughts on this? <laughs> um, in our co-edited book, we have a paper on Mongolia between China and Russia, in which they argue that Mongolia's effort to be non-aligned has withered. It's become much harder. They're situated in such a way, there's little leverage and the Chinese and Russians have sort of joined together in pressure, pressuring Mongolia in a more serious way. That article, those have, Articles on Mongolia have also appeared in the journal I edit, the Assad Forum. So if you want to follow that up, you can uh, look more carefully at Mongolia. I think Mongolia matters. I'm glad you brought it up. Okay, Mark Tokola from KEI. I've got a Korea specific question for, uh, for Hennig, Hennig him. In this polling about support for a possible strongman, when you ask the Korean public that, what kind of strongman do they have in mind? Is it Putin or Xi Jinping or is it Park Chung-hee or Donald Trump? You know, what does that mean? There's different stripes of strongmen. Kim jong -un. And then on the other, also about that uh, same question, um, is it an ideological question where only the rightist would want a strong person or are the progressives who'd want to see a strong leftist president? Thank, thanks for that question. Yeah, I, I didn't have time to uh, describe it during the presentation. But essentially, the question I used was, would you prefer having a strong leader that doesn't abide by the rules, you know, that kind of ignores parliament and, and kind of just does their own thing? And so in a way, it could be many different um, political leaders, but um, I wanted to keep it a little bit vague to the extent in which um, I didn't want them to I didn't want the responses to think of a particular leader when they were answering this question. But the reason why I ended up using this question was because in the second survey, I actually asked the question, you know, um, how do you feel about what's going on with the Ukraine war? And of course, all of the respondents, um, or the majority of respondents said, you know, they don't approve of what's happening. Um, how do you feel about China? They don't, there were a lot of unfavorable attitudes towards China. How do you feel about Russia? There were a lot of unfavorable attitudes towards Russia. But then when I started to ask the more detailed questions about democratic properties, you know, how would you feel about having free and fair elections? How do you feel about having army rule? I asked them a number of different questions that would kind of get at how they actually felt about a liberal democracy versus a not versus an autocracy. And it wasn't within these questions where I actually really started to see the differences between the respondents who would say, yeah, I, I don't like what's happening in the Ukraine war, but I actually kind of prefer these kind of autocratic properties of, a, of an institution as well. So there was definitely that disconnect. And so I wanted to kind of get at that. And one of the questions that I incorporated was supporting this strongman leadership. I, um, the questions related to army rule and other things were also had showed similar results as well. But for the purpose of this study, I only incorporated that to see whether or not uh, there would be this kind of link towards Putin. And um, in terms of partisanship, 
there was definitely a leaning towards um, conservatives who showed more support for strongman leadership, but it wasn't by a lot. And so, um, as I mentioned previously, there were some gender differences, there were age differences, but not so much bipartisanship. Uh, so yeah, thanks for that question. Okay, and this will be the last question. My question will be um, very short anyway. Uh, since we have, um, first of all, my name is Roy Shin, uh, retired professor from uh, O'Neill School. I've been at IU for 30 years anyway, just in case you haven't seen me on the campus. But my question is a, uh, is actually to uh, the expertise we have from Central Asia. Uh, I was stationed, in fact, in a Biscat, Kyrgyzstan, on the IU United States Department project for three years, in and out. And then, but wh where does the uh, Kyrgyzstan stand in this whole Central Asian? Yeah. Kyrgyzstan oh. um, uh, hasn't really met Kyrgyzstan is behind Kazakhstan in terms of implementing the Belt and Road Initiative. Um, I think it has very close economic relations with China. Um, when you say where they stand, do you mean, um, do they practice multi-vectorism? Mm -hmm. I think so, in terms of relations with China and Russia. And I know there was an American university there years ago. I'm not more that still one. there. Is it still called American University? In Bishkek. Okay, yeah. yeah. I visited there once, so I, I remember yeah. that very well. And that seemed like part of the multi-vectorism, but certainly Russia and China probably are more important to Kyrgyzstan, although Turkey had some influence also. Um, is that what you meant about multi-vectorism? Well, no, that's fine. I just was wondering exactly what role the Kyrgyzstan plays in this framework. Well, um, in terms of what Kazakhstan is doing, Kyrgyzstan seems to support it. Uh, Tajikistan seems less interested in, in this sort of collective security. Tajikistan wants more of, a, in fact, they said that at one of the meetings, uh, the Tajiks said they wanted Russia to play a role in security. They wanted more of a traditional patron-client relationship that they didn't even like the five plus one format. They wanted to go back to the old ways. And they were very upset with Putin because they didn't feel he was carrying out a security role in Central Asia. You know, there's a lot of different conflicts in different places in Central Asia and Russia wasn't solving them. Okay, thank you. Well, unfortunately, time is up. It's after six o'clock. And I would like to thank you, everyone here who came out on Friday night, cold afternoon. Thank you again. And please, round of applause for the panelists. Really. It was really a kind of an eye opening kind of a discussion. And we delved into the matters of different countries pretty deeply. And thank you, Professor Kim from Korea. I know it's very early in the morning there and thanks for joining us. Thanks again and have a good weekend. <laughs>